Hey, I'm Conan O'Brien. Welcome to Serious Jibber Jabber. I'm here with Judd Apatow, the producer, director, and screenwriter of some of the most successful comedies in recent years, including Anchorman, 40-Year-Old Virgin, Knocked Up, Bridesmaid, Superbad, and Talladega Nights, just to name a few of 700. His latest <laughs> film, This Is 40, opens December 21st. Judd, thanks a lot for being here. It is great to be here. Uh, so much to talk about. I want to start, I, I, I'm a few years older than you. But How old are you? Uh, I'm 49. Yes. I was born in 63. And, but I know that you were born a couple of years later. For me, comedy was not an option when I was a, a kid. It, it didn't, it, no one in my family was in show business. I'm living in Boston. Uh, and then I saw it as this great escape, but I never really thought it could happen. How did it all happen for you? Was it a similar experience? Uh, I, you know, I had something that made me think things were possible, which was uh, my grandfather was this guy, Bobby Shad, mm -hmm. who produced jazz. And so he was a legend in the family. He produced the first Janis Joplin record, and he produced Dinah Washington and, and uh, uh, Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker. Right. And he was this guy from the Bronx who loved jazz, just a, you know, a normal kid from no money, depression-era kid, who somehow saved up enough money to go record a, you know, a jazz group and then right. press some records and sell it. And slowly he started his own label and worked for labels and was this great kind of self-made man. And somewhere in my head I must have thought, oh, you can do that in comedy. If you're just a lunatic and you work hard and you obsess over it, uh, you can get in. So I, I always thought I could get in. I just knew it would take a crazy amount of work. Did you, when did you get a sense that you had comedy abilities? Like how, how, how young were you when you realized, okay, this is a superpower that I have? I, uh, I liked comedy much more than I was funny. I, I just was obsessed with Bill Cosby first. My dad mm -hmm. loved Cosby, so yep. wonderfulness, the chicken heart monster, all of that. And I'd listen to George Carlin and then, you know, Saturday Night Live hit. So Saturday Night Live hit when I was uh, eight. So maybe around the second or third season, I was really trying hard to stay up late and not fall asleep and right. watch SNL. And, but I don't think I was that funny. I was like a little kid and I had to make jokes and, and the classic, you know, making fun of yourself because you're a pick class and gym class and. Uh, yeah, I would know uh, about that. Yeah. I, I, I relate, yeah. <laughs> Which was an awful thing. It really did ruin your whole life because gym was every day. And at lunch, everyone would play sports every day. So there were two times every day where you were publicly humiliated as being worse than half the girls in your grade. And, uh, right. and I always thought, well, I'm in right field. The ball never gets to me. So I never have an opportunity to show them that I deserve to be anywhere else. And I always felt like I'm in this like cycle of failure. Yes, uh, so like a Kafka-esque nightmare. There were no left. Never, there's, yeah, right. there's no lefties hitting anything in the right field. Well, so you, you, you know, it's it's funny because now comedy is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It yeah. feels like there's a lot more comedy than there was when we were kids. Yeah, way, way more. And no one liked comedy. There weren't like people I could share it with. I was obsessed with it. I didn't have like my nerd friend, and we talked about Steve Martin together. Right. I was completely alone. There was no Conan, like, at school. And so when I uh, went to California, I went to USC to film school, uh, I started doing stand-up, and then I met, you know, all these people, like, you'd meet Dana Gould, and you could talk for 10 hours about Monty Python. Right. But it took until I was 18, 19, 20 years old to find those people. It was like being the bee girl in the in the Blind Melon video. Right. And then right. suddenly like, oh, look at all of these like great nerds who know everything that I know about Michael Keaton's stand-up career. Okay, there's a funny thing that happened uh, the other day. I'm watching television, Dick Van Dyke, an old Dick yeah. Van Dyke show's on, and it's from, I think it was from 1962. And uh, 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 Rob Petrie and, uh, and his wife, are, Mary Tyler Moore, are invited to a party. Mm -hmm. And he's really nervous because it's a party of intellectuals and important people. And he says, I'm, I'm just the head writer for the Alan Brady show. Yeah. And he's very self-conscious and thinks he's going to be judged. He goes to the party and no one cares about him. Mm -hmm. And I thought that wouldn't happen today. That's such a marker of the time. Sure. In, when we were kids uh, in, the, in the late 60s or through the 60s and probably even into early into the 70s, I don't think comedy was a legitimate option. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? My yeah. parents are professionals. It wasn't a legitimate option. And then overnight, there are all these, like today, there are kids yeah. at Brown and Yale who's, mm -hmm. and their parents, 
their biggest dream for yeah. them would be to be you, when that mm -hmm. might be a nightmare scenario 20 years ago. Yeah. It became like as respectable as stockbroker. You, you know sure. what I mean? Yeah, because they, we've seen that that's where all the Harvard guys go. They go to The Simpsons and right. write for all of these shows. Uh, yeah, it didn't. So it's our fault. <laughs> it is, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'll tell you a funny thing. I wrote a, a Simpsons episode exactly 22 years ago. Oh. And I would have been, I, I, I been there then. Uh, well, I know. I think this predated you. Is I wrote it during the first, what year was the first season of Simpsons? 89? 89, I think. So yeah. I wrote, after six aired, I wrote my spec Simpsons. And uh, I was talking about the story that, uh, that I wrote, which was about Homer taking the family to a hypnotism show and being uh, put under to think he was 10 and the hypnotist has a heart attack and for the rest of the show him and Bart are best friends right. and then they go on the run because Homer doesn't want to be woken up and have to have responsibility. He loves being a kid. Right. Uh, and then I, I realized everything I've done for my whole career is basically that story. You and just keep rewriting form. that <laughs> Simpsons <laughs> episode. And I told that story publicly for the first time and then uh, I got a call from the Simpsons that said we, we're, we're going to shoot that uh, episode next year. And not pay you. <laughs> and not pay, pay you yeah. $2,200. So I, now I can uh, retire. That's all. That was the first thing I ever uh, So ever you're wrote. going to get a Simpsons episode. I'm going to get a Simpsons episode. That's fantastic. Uh, but, um, so, uh, yes, it is a, a respectable job. And, I mean, it is almost like, I guess it's like being a, a, a singer-songwriter or a, a, an artist of, of some sort. Uh, it's a big part of the culture, comedy. Yes. A, and a respectable part with The Daily Show and right. things that affect... Uh, it's become, it's become legitimate, uh, I think. And obviously there's a lot of shows that came along mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s that made it legitimate. Mm -hmm. I was curious what the movies are. There, uh, it wasn't just the movies. There's a couple of events that changed everything for mm -hmm. me. I really do think Steve Martin yeah. was, was uh, I know for you and was for me too, Steve Martin obviously very respected mm -hmm. today. I don't know. I can't explain to young people sometimes who like him, yeah. but I can't explain to him what an atomic explosion that was yeah. when he showed up, how nobody had been quite that funny before. Yeah. That's how I felt. I yeah. felt like things were funny, mm -hmm. everything was, and then Steve Martin came along and it, it almost took the air out of the room. It was so powerful. Yeah. Did you have that experience too? I, I mean, I must have talked in his accent for years. I mean, I don't know how obnoxious I could have been talking like him right. for years. And, and so he hit, 78, 79 yes. is when it started happening on where there would be these Saturday Night Live episodes where every single sketch was unbelievable. It wasn't yes. like a week a and half hour. And King Tut, where you're gathered around yeah. the TV. It's a different time. Today yeah. we'd all be watching it mm -hmm. on the internet. Three months later. Three months later, uh, you, we sound like 100 year old men, <laughs> but you're gathered around your television yeah. and you're watching him do yeah. King Tut. Well, you had no sense that any episode of Saturday Night Live would ever be on again. So because you didn't know which shows they would rerun or when, there was, you know, in the, at that time, no way to record it. Right. I used to record it with an audio cassette uh, recorder to yeah. listen to it again. Uh, so when you watched it, 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 it was, you know, it was slipping through your fingers as it, as it was happening. And I guess because uh, he was the first guy to completely mock every... Uh, tradition of stand-up, just make fun of the whole approach to it, just made you laugh so hard, because you'd been conditioned to watch all these other guys for so long, and then he's just mocking the whole thing. Well, I mean, my, the steady diet when I was a kid were these Bob Hope specials, yeah. and only later on did I go back and watch the Bob Hope movies, which are fantastic. I mean, he's, he's brilliant, he's yeah. amazing. But you'd see these specials where he's wearing the conservative blue blazer, joke, mm -hmm. joke, joke, yeah. joke, joke, and then this guy comes along and it did feel like overnight everything changed. Then he made the best movie ever. Then the jerk the comes jerk. out, yeah. and your mind is blown that he somehow took that act and made the funniest movie ever. The first thing I ever did when I moved to California and started getting some writing jobs was try to find a way to reach his agent to write the sequel to The Jerk, yeah. uh, which he was never interested in doing. But that was my dream. What if there was another uh, uh, The Jerk? But... Um, and then, and then, I mean, I, you know, for me, Man with Two Brains. Mm -hmm. I mean, it kept going for like many years with him hitting the, the comedy that hard. Yes. Where, I mean, Cruel Shoes. With he had the book, and wow, he's writing a book, and it's kind of short stories and. And that, in the same, the only person before who had 
because I had been a big fan of Woody Allen's prose. Yeah. I, I loved his short stories. I mm -hmm. loved the way he wrote and, yeah. and, and, and thought that was the funniest writing mm -hmm. I had read and that I loved that Steve Martin yeah. came along in that tradition and said, no, this is cool, you can write mm -hmm. a book. And it's funny because I just, I just took a, a photograph with him for Vanity Fair. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, when I was a kid, I was driving uh, past his house with my grandma because we knew where he lived. And so anytime we went anywhere, no matter what direction, we had to drive past Steve Martin's house. And one day, Steve Martin is just in front of his house. So I jumped out of the car and I asked him for his autograph. And he said, I'm sorry I don't sign autographs at my house, which is a very, you know, if someone came to my house, I'd be calling armed people right. to, to deal with it. So, but right, at the time, right. I didn't know you don't walk up to people at their homes. And he said, no, I don't sign autographs at my house. So I said, well, why don't you sign it in the street? Uh, which was pretty good for 12. Yeah. For 12, not a bad joke. Uh, he said, no, I really, I can't, because then people are going to come all the time. He was very polite. I went home in a rage. I was like, I want to, I was so mad. And I, I, I wrote this letter to him, you know, dear Steve, you're the funniest man in the world, but you treat your fans like crap. And if I didn't buy all your records and go to all your movies, you wouldn't live in that house. And if you don't send me an apology, I'm going to send your address to Homes of the Stars and you're going to have tour buses passing by 24 hours a day. Uh, it, just this crazy rant. And then I put it in his, his mailbox, like, I know where you live. Uh, so six months later, I get a package, I open it up, it's Cruel Shoes, and inside, and this is 1980, so this is uh, uh, 32 years ago, mm -hmm. it says, uh, to Judd, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was speaking to the underlined Judd Apatow, <laughs> your friend Steve Martin. You know what's sad? Now that inscription is not funny. You know, if someone <laughs> sees it now, it's just like, do you know what I mean? Well, I Your mean, fame has ruined that inscription. Well, the anecdote is like my only good anecdote, and I tell it all the time, I always feel bad. He actually told that anecdote, uh, he co-opted the anecdote and told it uh, on a talk show. Um, so we took a picture mocking that story for Vanity Fair uh, a couple of weeks ago, which was just one of the highlights of my life. Now, I want to talk a little bit about your process. You, you, you use improv, mm -hmm. and you use great improvisational actors. I've always had a problem with mm -hmm. improv. I started mm -hmm. in improv, yeah. and, and back in 1985 when I came out to L.A., that's the first thing I wanted yeah. to do, and I would do it at night. Mm -hmm. I'd do my writing gig, and then yeah. I'd go to improv mm -hmm. uh, classes. I would do shows, and I always thought, this is great, but you've got to use it very carefully yeah. because it can be abused. Mm -hmm. You're someone who uses improvisation with great control. Uh, I think other people see what you're doing and think, oh, right, improv, yeah. mm -hmm. that's how you do it. And then things meander all over yeah. the place. What's your technique on the set to make sure that improv is calibrated correctly yeah. and that people yeah. just don't go on for six hours babbling? Yeah. Well, I think uh, some of it has been misunderstood. There's certainly scenes where we get there and we go, this scene doesn't even work. What are we, what are we thinking? Okay, what right. are we going to do? Most days, it's really not improv. It's uh, rewriting on its feet. Yes. You know, we start doing the scene, and then I, and then I just, just take out a pad. Or so, you know, a lot of times, I'll have a you know, co-producer who's a writer, like Paul Appel from Saturday Night Live, and, right. and we just try to beat the jokes. Uh, you know, we're not changing the scene at all. Like The basic direction of the scene is exactly the same. Uh, and then while we're watching, uh, we do a process where after a bunch of takes where we really work on performance, I just interrupt and yell out alternate lines. And it almost becomes an improv between me and the actors. And it's something that, uh, you know, Ben Stiller does and Adam McKay does. It's a, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, when, you know, sometimes, you know, Will Ferrell's at the anchor desk, Adam McKay will just keep giving him, you know, bizarre lines I'll to say. I'll punch you in the ovaries. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly, and that comes from just a stream of consciousness that can only happen because you're watching the scene. There are scenes where we do let it go. That definitely happens. You know, the whole thing in uh, the 40-year-old the virgin, there was a couple of scenes with Steve where we knew, okay, we're going to wax Steve. We don't really need to script this. I just said, Steve, I would just like you to curse at the woman doing it and then apologize. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about some curses, but I didn't know in what order, and, and I just waxed them. And then, you know, then I would you know, switch to a close-up and give him some alternate jokes to get specific. Right. The, uh, the you know how I know you're gay was something that just kind of came out of a long babbly you know, chat while they were doing video games. And then we said, oh, this is funny. And we took a 45 minute break and wrote 50 of them. Uh, my favorite ones are the ones that are emotional, an emotional moment that comes up. 
for instance, um, in the new movie, there's a moment where Leslie's talking to my daughter Iris. So mm -hmm. Iris is eight when we shot this, and they're in bed, and she just starts talking to Iris about, uh, you know, do you want to have kids? And Iris says, uh, I only want to have one because if you have two, one fights with the other. And Leslie says, do you, does it bother you when people fight? She's like, no, I don't want, I don't want anybody to fight. And that's just an improv. It's, yeah, just it's, a, a, it's, it's a powerful a, moment, though. It makes you very yeah. sad. It makes she's... you sad. Yeah, it's terrible. It's terrible because, you know, you think... You know, she doesn't like when she fights with her sister. She doesn't like, you know, if she ever sees fights at our house. Uh, but she also knows the movie. Like, she's a good actress. She's tracking the story, even as an eight-year-old. She knows she's in bed post-fight. And so, you know, so, sometimes something weird and magical happens that you can't get that rhythm unless you open it up for the actors. Now, I do not... I, I, I don't think I could work with anyone that I'm related to. I don't know, mm -hmm. I, I, I love my family, I'm really close to them, but I haven't worked with them. Is it, uh, in some ways I would imagine it would be easier that you work with mm -hmm. your wife and children. In other ways I would think maybe it's more difficult. Uh, it's uh, reckless. It definitely feels, you know, when, when, it, when it's done, I always think that was crazy. What was I thinking? That really could have gone wrong. Uh, I mean, because when we're doing it, I just think, if this movie's bad, it's just a worldwide humiliation for my my wife and children. <laughs> well, if, we've all gone down with this yeah, shit, Yeah, I right. mean, this really would be terrible because people are inclined to not like you for doing it. I mean, I think that people have issues with people like working with family for some reason. Um, but, you know, my wife is just such an incredible actress and she does something that I just haven't seen anyone do, which is she can play the deepest emotional life of a, of a person and, and stuff that's sad. Uh, and intense, and then she also can do funny at the exact same time. She can be, you know, getting jokes in the in a moment that's hard drama. Yeah. In addition to playing light comedy, uh, and I just haven't seen anybody who can go to that emotional level. Uh, there's a scene in uh, Knocked Up where she's mad at Paul Rudd because she's on a website looking to find out where all the child molesters are who live in their neighborhood, mm -hmm. and Paul won't take it seriously and. Right. Keeps making jokes like, uh, "Oh, so we won't trick or treat at their house," and and it, you see her get madder and madder, until finally she just talks about wanting to rip his f face off, and it would kill in a movie theater. But if you watch it alone, there's nothing in her face that says, "I'm going for a laugh," right. and that's a kind of laugh I love. Like, "Oh, this is hard reality," but yet it still allows for some you know laugh release. And then my kids are strangely funny. Uh, and they're bored of being on set, so they're not scared that cameras are around. They're very unselfconscious. Yeah, it's very weird. Most kids are self-conscious as actors, and obviously there's some that are very good. They, they just seem very much themselves. Well, they get sucked into what their real problems are with each other. Right. Like, they're, they're so annoyed with each other that they're not distracted by the fact that they're shooting a movie and it needs to go well. They're more concerned about whatever argument I'm trying to make them have on camera. So if I say, okay, Maude, tell her that she can't watch Lost, she's, she's too young. Maude wants her to not watch Lost. She's, she's mad, she's like, I'm, you know, I'm 14 years old, I'm allowed to watch Lost, you're eight, you have to wait six years, and if you see it before six years, I got screwed. And so she's mad, and then Iris really doesn't get why she can't watch Lost. In her head, right. I can handle any TV show, I can handle any violence, any content, and then they just get sucked in and they just forget anyone's well, they're, watching. Yeah, they're tapping into something real. Yeah, Maud is pissed. Like there's a scene where Maud, um, they, they talk about taking away the Wi-Fi in the house. And Maud, she knows it's funny and she's performing, but she's mad because we've done that to her at, at times and she's using it. Yeah. So it's kind of weird that they know how to do it. I, I, I uh, it's like giving them a skill, I don't know where else they'll use it. Because most people don't shoot this way. And it's not like we're trying to make them actors. We're not, I just wanted this movie to work. The only danger I would think is them seeing the movie and you've got family members who say, where's that take? Oh, exactly. Where, uh, the, 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 the moment where I did this was brilliant. Yeah. And, yeah, and what's going on? And you're stuck in a car ride with them for six hours. You've got to explain. I've had two terrible moments of, oh, no, I don't want my kids to turn into weird uh, child celebrities. One was when Iris was eight, I had put her in several movies and cut her out every time. 
and she's turned to me at eight and said, Daddy, I am so tired of getting thrown into the DVD extras. I thought, this is a bad sign. <laughs> uh, and the other one uh, was Maud was not happy to be on the same card for her credit with Iris. Right. She's like, why is everything together? I'm not a partner with her. <laughs> That's fantastic. So you, they're already developing exactly. those same resentments. Yeah. Uh, you have said you do not consider yourself smart. I don't understand what. In, That's it, true. <laughs> that is true. I don't understand that that uh, that statement. Well, I uh, I feel like I'm a, uh, emotionally in tune and, and uh, observant, and some of my neuroses are helpful for for comedy. But I don't have a lot of brain power. My memory is not very good, and kind of you know complex ideas uh, don't stick. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do understand people's emotional. Life, right. I, uh, I um, which uh, it might be the highest form of intelligence. Really, uh, think about it. I don't know. It does. I mean, I'm still you know neurotic as hell and surprised that you know how how it shows itself changes as I get older. But it's probably the same amount of neuroses. Uh, I mean, I don't know how you are, but you know when I like go to s school to pick up my kids, the second I hit that hallway, I'm in eighth grade again. I'm embarrassed, I feel like a nerd, I feel like nobody likes me. I, right. You know, it's, it's just, it becomes like your imprint. Um, and uh, I become the coolest kid in school. Do you? Like, <laughs> look at me, I'm 6'4", <laughs> I'm in second grade, <laughs> I have a TV show. <laughs> but uh, no, I know what you, uh, you know, obviously it's been said many times to be funny, you need to be in touch with some kind of insecurity. Mm -hmm. And I've many times thought I do not know how a handsome, well-adjusted person yeah. who girls liked when they were in the third grade, who were natural athletes, could ever be funny. Hey, why is Matt Damon funny? Yeah. Why yeah. is Clooney funny? Where yeah. does that come from? See, it, it, They're not that funny. I, yeah, well, they are kind of. I, you know, no, at you. I'm going on record. <laughs> okay. They're funny. They're, yeah. they're, you know, they're leading actor funny. Exactly. Okay, they're there's a whole other level. And I'll take this yeah. on me, yeah. by the way. Okay. No, I've... Uh, uh, they are, and it's unfair, yeah. because I feel that I've come by, this is what I had. That's how it felt to me. Yeah. I went through a checklist of what are my options, and then I got to, okay, at least I seem to be able to make my friends laugh, and mm -hmm. then I put all my money on 27 Red, you mm -hmm. know, everything. Yeah. And when someone else comes along who, who is pretty funny, and they're also a great athlete, yeah. and they seem like they're... They had a great time. For yeah. me, if they enjoyed school, yeah. I hated school when I was a kid. Yeah. Just hated it. And when I hear about kids that loved going to school. They love school, they got laid a lot, and they're funny. Yeah. And good at sports. Yeah. I hate those people. No. There's two, or there's like maybe seven in the world, but they need to die. And who's funny? Obama. Is, is Obama funny? I think he is funny. Let's really I, talk about this, because is, it, is he really funny, or has he learned... The rhythm? Has he learned the rhythm because he needed to, and he's a very smart guy? I have not been able to get a handle on how naturally funny Obama is. I don't think we've had very many naturally funny presidents. Mm -hmm. I actually think often it's a liability. I think John F. Kennedy was maybe our last really funny president. I think he had a good yeah. sense of irony. I don't know. Is Obama funny? I saw a, a, a town hall uh, meeting he was doing when he was running for president the first time. And he was so funny and also a little cutting with the crowd and, and, and a sophisticated sense of humor that I realized that they're holding him back and that if he showed people how funny he is, people would dislike him. That it was, you know, maybe there's almost something, you know, condescending in being that funny with the, right. with the common people. But I thought, oh, this is not a side that they want to show it's people. It's funny, because uh, you say that because I've been friends for many mm. years with Al Franken, and mm. then he becomes a senator, and I can see he works really hard. To never be funny again. He, he works so hard, <laughs> works so hard at not saying the funny idea that comes yeah. into his head, because in the world we live in now, it has to be innocuous when you mm. read it on the printed page. Now, That's you've right. been in writer's rooms yeah. all your life, and so mm. have I. I say a thousand t things a day, and so do all my writers, that if it was read at a trial, you <laughs> yeah. could not defend it. Yeah. They would say, did you say this, Mr. O'Brien? Yeah. Yes, I, I did say that, about yeah. that horrible thing that happened in history. Yeah. Defend it, I can't. Yeah, I do it Take with my kids all day long. I really? think there's nothing funnier than inappropriate humor to children. 
I do ethnic humor. Right. I do terrible voices that would end my career. Right. I, it makes me laugh so hard, and it makes them laugh so hard. That do they, they go, repeat it? Uh, they don't repeat it. We have a real rule, like, this is... Jokes for the house. Jokes for the house. Don't take it to school. <laughs> you could get expelled for it. But it does. But you know, inappropriateness is always funny. Yes. So, yes. My favorite thing is what would be the worst thing I could do. I yeah, spend yeah. hours and hours and hours with my writers and with my mm -hmm. staff, acting out the worst thing I could yeah. ever do, and they'll be crying. They'll be laughing so hard. And then, of course, I can't even do it on the yeah. on the show on the TV show, even if it's an edgy show, because it's too much. Yeah. That's What's the whole the career idea. ender. Every, exactly. every interview is a potential career ender. Right. Because anything can just get spread. So it doesn't matter. You, I could be doing an interview with some local uh, video site in Australia, and I say the wrong thing, and, yes. uh, and, and it's, it's, it's done. And then we all turn our backs on you, Good which chances, we would exactly. instantly. I'd have to. That's how it works. I get that. Uh, let's talk about the talent you have found. Mm -hmm. Seth Rogen, Jonah Hill, Jason Siegel, James Franco, Lena Dunham. How are you finding these people in an era? I sometimes think it's only gotten harder to find the really great people because everybody's everywhere. Mm -hmm. They're all on YouTube sites. And in a way, the technology has made it harder to focus. Mm -hmm. How do you find these people? How do you know that they're that yeah. good? I mean, when you first met yeah. Jonah Hill, did you think someday this guy's gonna be an Oscar-nominated actor? Well, Jonah Hill's a funny story because we were looking for someone to do one line in The 40-Year-Old Virgin, he was the person that went into the eBay store and didn't understand the concept right. of a store that sold your stuff on eBay. And he just made us laugh. We could tell he was funny. And on the day, we had a lot of free time, so we forced him to improvise for 40 minutes with Catherine Keener, purely to make him nervous. Mm -hmm. And he just made us laugh, and then, then some of that made its way into the movie, so then you just go, oh, that guy's funny. And then when I was doing Knocked Up, uh, he had become friends with everybody. I thought, I'm just gonna hire all of Seth's actual friends, we're gonna use their real names, right. and use this real dynamic, and then in the middle of that shoot, we were trying to cast Superbad, and one day we went, oh, the, why don't we just use Jonah? Yeah, He's, he's perfect, so it, it kinda happens like that. I think it's the same as you know with your show, where at some point, you're looking for like a funny woman, and you're like, hey, why don't we throw Amy Poehler in this sketch, she's funny. Yep. And, and that's kinda the same like with the movie, it's the same as deciding, uh, you know, uh, let's put, you know, just any of the people that you've thrown into, like, sketches. It's the same for a movie. You just go, what's with that James Franco guy? He seems kind of interesting. And, and that's kind of all there is to it. It's kind of like being yes. a fan of comedy where you see comedians all day long, but every once in a while you go, oh, that guy's crazy funny. That Hannibal Burris, oh, my God, dude. Yeah, yeah. That's a whole other thing. And you, you notice that in an audition. Someone just pops and you go, Jason Siegel. That kid is crazy funny. There's a lot going on there emotionally. Yeah. He's interesting. He's vulnerable. And, uh, you know, we've gotten lucky with how many of them uh, turn out to be really good. To me, there's, there's such a... It, this point's been made by other people, but I, I don't think it's been made enough. Comedy and music. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're interested in music. I love music. I always think there's a... It's the same idea. Musicians find each other just because... Yeah. They hear someone playing and they know that they can fall in with them and yeah. play with them. And comedy is the exact same thing where, you know, I started a, with the late night show in 93 and I just knew that I have to do this with Robert Smigel. Yeah. And that's just the thing I know first. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that, I found Andy Richter. We didn't even yeah. know what we were going to do with him. I met him in a restaurant and I thought, he's just... We need him. And yeah. it's like Robin Hood and his Merry Men. Yeah, and then yeah, exactly. Louis, Louis yeah. C.K. was one of our first writers. Mm -hmm. And we just, he's just really funny. Yeah. Now, it took a long time for technology, mm -hmm. I think, and the world to catch up to Louis. But he was this funny in 1993. But you find all these people, yeah. and then it just... And the next thing you know, there's a list right. of all these people. And really, it's just your taste. It just comes down to your taste and what you personally connect to. Someone gave me uh, Tiny Furniture, Lena Dunham's movie. Yeah. And I put it in. I didn't know she wrote it. I didn't know she was the actress in it. I didn't know the name Lena Dunham. Someone just said, this movie's interesting. And I, and I watched it, and at the end, I'm like, so she wrote it, she directed it, she produced it, that's her sister, and her mom played her mom, and... and it cost $8. It cost $8, and, right. and it just blew my mind, and I thought, well, I love this. It's like personal, intimate comedy, and she's using her family. I relate to everything she's trying to do. Right. Uh, and so... I just contact her and go, what are, you, what are you doing? Can I help you with anything? And then you know, she told me about 
about this girl's idea she was beginning to think about. And, that, and, that, and it's like that with each, each person. And, uh, I, you know, I'm just like a fan. You know, when I meet, even when I meet someone like Seth Rogen uh, when he's 16 years old, part of my mind is just a fan going, I like to watch that guy do funny stuff. Yeah. Well, I don't know what it is. And then as he revealed that he was actually very thoughtful and had his own ideas. He's a writer. I, I was like, oh, I'd love to see him as the lead. No one ever lets that guy be the lead. I want to see that guy in the lead. That'd yeah. be an interesting kind of person to, to put in a movie. Uh, and then he just rocks it, you know? So that's, that's the fun part, is to give people an opportunity, and then they just exceed any expectation you had uh, for what they could do. Were you, you were a fan of Jim Carrey's, mm -hmm. and then got to know him. Yeah. And of course, everybody knows it just, that spectacular, that Jim Carrey explosion, which yeah. was a lot, which was I think similar to a lot of people for the Steve Martin explosion. When, when yeah. he hit, there was a, oh my God, this guy is, funny on a different level. He's so physically yeah. reckless, he's so committed. I mean, I, you know, I was, uh, there's a, you know, I edited this issue of Vanity Fair that you uh, wrote a hilarious uh, piece oh, okay. for, like mm -hmm. it really was hysterical. And there's a picture of Jim Carrey and I had to write the caption for it and I said, you know, Jim Carrey's the funniest man on earth. We could all debate number two all day long, yeah. but Jim Carrey's the funniest guy. Uh, and, you know, when I was doing stand-up, I would go to the Improv in the Valley, it was in the Hilton Hotel, and David Spade would be there. It was like the, the conference room. But great people like Drake Sather were there and Sandler would come in. And Jim Carrey started coming in. And I had seen him do impressions on TV, but he was, you know, he, that's what his act was. He would do Sammy, Sammy Davis Jr. and Clint Eastwood and James Dean. And it was remarkable because he could make his face look like anybody, which was super weird, right. but, but really ingenious. But he decided, I'm not gonna do any impressions. I'm tossing everything out, I'm gonna write an act. I'm gonna go on stage, I'm gonna improvise and play. And every night, Jim Carrey, with crazy young man energy, would semi-improvise for 20 minutes. And it was the best thing I had ever seen. It was so bizarre and funny. And uh, he would kill, and then he would bomb so hard for five minutes, and then he would win them back. And, and I called my manager, Jimmy Miller, and I said, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. And uh, he signed him, and, and I don't get commission, I get nothing. <laughs> so I used to open We're on the road. take up a collection for you later, yeah. But I would open on the road for him, so we would go, uh, I remember we went to the Atlanta Punchline. Yeah. And he had just done like half a season of A Living Color. So no one really knew who he was. And, uh, and, and he was, you know, so physical and so funny. And then it, after the show, we would be talking, and then suddenly like we're talking and talking. And then it's like, it's seven in the morning. And, and we've stayed up all night, and Jim has so much energy. He's, you know, it's like nothing you've still, ever seen. He's still that way, too. Yeah. Which is, he still has uh, incredible energy, and there is a sweetness about him. Yeah. He is very genuine about comedy and what's right and what's good mm -hmm. and people being good to each other. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's an energy that comes off of him that I still find really inspirational. I, I think that's why people uh, you know, connect with him. You know, the, the second night we were in Atlanta, I was like, wow, that was wild. We stayed up all night talking. That was incredible and, and, and inspirational and hilarious. And then the next night, it was like four in the morning. I'm like, he's going to do it again. Yeah. He's ready to like go. And, and he's always been like that. Uh, that's been just a really fun thing to be around is seeing him get Ace Ventura and the mask and eternal sunshine and just, just as a friend to watch him take these crazy risks and really succeed a lot. I mean, when we did Cable Guy, it really was a crazy thing to do, which is, okay, now I wanna play this demented person and I'm right. gonna speak with a lisp and it's kind of a parody of unlawful entry and how, hand that rocks the this cradle. There's real darkness to it. Yeah. yeah, and he's like, I'm not gonna play the same guy in every movie. Right? He, he was throwing down the gauntlet. I'm gonna yeah. do different things. And that led to doing The Truman Show and I Love You, Philip Morris, because he, he was like, I'm gonna do everything. You know, in this career, I, I'm not going to just get stuck in one style of humor. I'll go back to that. I like that also, but I also, you know, want to. How do you do feel other about things. Cable Guy now? Do you go back and watch it? I mean, at the time, so much was written about just what it, what his paycheck was. It all got distorted, mm -hmm. and I feel like it's one of those movies that when I see it now, there's so much good stuff in there. And I think at the time, mm -hmm. it feels a lot to me that it was a Variety headline about what he was getting paid. Yeah, he it got was, twenty million dollars. The budget was forty. It wound up costing 42, it grossed 100. But at the time it was like, how come it didn't make 200? And so people expected it just be some cash cow. 
Uh, and when I watch it now, I definitely watch it and think, this movie is crazy weird. Yeah. I, and there's so many bizarre things in it. And when we shot it, we laughed so hard every day. And like you know, we, There was you know, scenes where it was just lisp jokes, but Jim would just do it so funny. There was a scene where he's like listening to a tape, like how to fix your lisp. I got cut out and he would just sit there for like minutes, you know, before the scene started going, salmon, salmon, <laughs> salmon. <laughs> and we would laugh so hard. And then when, you know, uh, we put the movie together and it was, it was meant to be a thriller, it got a little scarier as a story. Yeah. And it's had this great afterlife and I really love it. But at the time you kind of don't realize like, oh, it is a little scarier than we thought. Than maybe we intended, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I always thought this is gonna be like a roller coaster ride. I mean, you know, it's silly, but people got scared because in the middle of it, Jim beats up Owen Wilson. Yes. And you kind of don't see it coming that he gets physical. And then and for it's the- quite violent. It's, <laughs> he makes him suck on the air blower in the bathroom, yeah, yeah. which Owen hated. He hated that, that that was in the scene of him like blowing the blow dryer. And I, I didn't know he hated it, so I gave him a photograph of it. And then somebody pointed to a garbage can and he had torn it up and <laughs> put it in the garbage. Um, but after that, for the rest of the movie, I think people thought like, the cable guy's gonna kill somebody. Yeah. And so it was hard to laugh right. at some of the jokes. It's a great second time movie. The second time you see it, you know, okay, Jim doesn't kill anybody. We're okay. Uh, uh, and you know, Jack Black's in it, and uh, Bob and Andy and Janine from the Ben Stiller show. There's a lot of kind of great, uh, you know, actors that we we loved in it. Was Airplane? This is out of completely. Out of, was Airplane an influential movie for you? I went to see Airplane when I was on vacation in California visiting my grandmother in Sherman Oaks. The line was insanely long, and my main memory was John Davidson. Mm -hmm. The great talk show host, mm -hmm. uh, you know, variety show entertainer. Best hair ever on fantastic television. Fantastic hair, walking to the front of the line and telling the manager that he needed to be let in because uh, he was going to get surrounded by fans. And he used that to Did cut the work? line. Did it work? Worked. Worked. The best would be if it didn't work and the long <laughs> walk back for John Davidson. <laughs> and that movie in that theater. There's, oh, there's three movies that I remember as the funniest movies I'd ever seen, I've ever seen in the theater. One was uh, the Airplane, okay. Mad, uh, Madhouse Laughs, like right, I've never seen. Right. Uh, I went to see in a, you know, in a revival theater, Young Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein. Still. Pandemonium, like yes. I really didn't expect it. And I went with Stiller on opening night to, to Santa Monica and watched something about Mary. Yes. And that was you know, as big a laugh as I've I ever saw a uh, something about Mary in a test screening. I don't know oh, why really? I was there, but it was some kind of test screening. And I went, and it was a kind of, and it was a real audience. It was mm -hmm. not an industry crowd. It was just real people. Mm -hmm. They lost their minds. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it, the air turned into, in, it, yeah. the atmosphere changed. Yeah. It was, uh, but uh, Airplane was a movie that I remember at the time, like, there's no real stars in this yeah. at the t but. It was the first time I saw someone use the deliberate as if it were deadly serious. Actually, that's not true. The first time I saw it was the Batman series with Adam West, yeah. you know, where it was just, you're saying something absurd, but with great, great yeah. seriousness. And, um, and I guess the Pink Panther movies had done that too, but Airplane, just, and so yeah. many jokes. I watched so it with my, uh, my, my daughter's 10 now, but I did watch it with her when she was eight. And it's kind of dirty. Yeah. There's like a there's there's a joke where it's the voices when you pull up to the airport saying you know the red zone is for loading right, and right, unloading, right. and then they start like fighting about whether or not she's going to get an abortion or something. It's like a, like I was really shocked at how dirty the movie got, and yeah. there were so many jokes that I thought, oh, there it, it, there's do the blow up. Uh, pilots like blow each other. <laughs> there's like there's a lot of uh, Randy humor in it. Uh, but it is, it, it completely holds up. Every completely joke holds up. up. Yeah, and I, I, to me, I think that must have been a fun writer's room. When I see yeah. things, I think that would be a great, because I love the writer's room. I think that's where some of the biggest laughs I've had in my life yeah. have never been on camera. Yeah. They've all been in the writer's room. Do you feel room. bad about that? You know, I really don't. <laughs> I really don't. I actually think there's something kind of magical yeah. about that. There have been enough laughs on, on the television yeah. shows 
and and enough that it's worked really well that I'm I feel fine. I just don't think you can ever. There's a purity yeah. to no one else is going to hear it this way. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever been in a. I mean, had that feeling in a room where something happens, someone gets yeah. going on a riff, and you know, I'm never going to capture this. Yeah. By the time we get this mm -hmm. in front of the equipment, yeah. it's going to be gone. Yeah. Well, you were a legend in the rooms where I was in other comedy rooms and we would hear how funny you were in the rooms and like, how come we don't have a guy being that funny in the room? I didn't know. I, when, I, when I was on The Simpsons, I thought I always was the Maury Amsterdam of the writer's room. Well, that's a stiff room somewhat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it that's is. a lot of thinkers. I mean, I worked for The Critic yeah. uh, for Al Jean and Mike Reese. Now, I don't know if people know this, but you know, when you work on an animated show, especially how they do it. You come in at 10 and you work till like seven, eight, nine o'clock, sometimes right. later. But these guys don't budge. I mean, Al Jean would fill up a, like a cup with pretzels and maybe a couple of M&Ms and he'd lay back and he'd go, okay, can we beat this line? And sometimes an hour on one line and, and everyone's just thinking and thinking so hard in between debates about Fermat's theorem and just math. Things that I went. They understand. I went mad because I need <laughs> energy. I need. Uh, I need it to be kinetic. So you had all these best writers I've ever worked with, and it's George Meyer and and John Vitti and Reese and Gene and Schwartzwell. Vitti's not doing any dances. No, they're all <laughs> sitting there, and I was being there, and I'd look around, and I'd be like, you know, we need it. What, what could Marge say at this moment? And then twenty minutes would go mm -hmm. by, and we're sitting on. Sh furniture yeah. that you would throw out of your dorm yeah. room. And they don't take a break. They don't take a break. <laughs> and so I started inventing any kind of crazy way to make them laugh, and yeah. then I became their monkey. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> um, and then actually they would they send you off to write your script, but mm -hmm. they would always pull me back pretty quickly because they were, they were like, they you. just <laughs> wanted the show. And yeah. I would do anything, yeah. and that's when. Uh, yeah. No one else would do that at those shows. Yeah. It and was that, a lot of math majors, strangely. It was, um, yeah, and, and brilliant guys, but the writer's room is not, I was, <clears throat> I need a fun writer's room. Yeah. I just do. I need it to be a show. I need the yeah. writer's room to be a show, and I've been kicked out by my writers because I'm wasting their time. Yeah. Do you remember when there was that lawsuit where uh, one of the writer's assistants at Friends, Friends, at Friends <laughs> sued yeah. the show because of all the inappropriate jokes? I, I actually, uh, the first thing I've ever, I ever directed was an episode of The Larry Sanders Show, which was about, uh, um, uh, the uh, Scott Thompson suing the show because there's too many uh, gay jokes being right. made in the office. Right. Right. Uh, and that, that's kind of a funny thing for someone to like sue a show for inappropriate humor because there is unlimited inappropriate humor in a room like that. I mean, come 1.32 in the morning, it shows like Larry Sanders where you, know, you would be there till three in the morning a fair amount. It gets crazy, like what is said it's at that time to. of night. Yeah. And the other thing is, I always have thought it's kind of like nuclear fission. You need to create this heat, this yeah. level of heat to make something funny happen, and it needs to happen in a contained lead box yeah. <laughs> that's 15 feet thick. Yeah. And that's what, gen and then that generates the steam that comes mm -hmm. shooting out at high pressure, yeah. and that powers the lights. When someone says, I don't like the amount of heat that's happening, yeah. you know, it yeah. has to be inappropriate. It has yeah. to be wildly inappropriate. Yeah. And I think that's, it's also impossible to explain to anybody. Because yeah. as, as you said, if you read a transcript of some of the things that you and I have riffed on in a room, or anybody that yeah. we know has riffed on in a room, it's indefensible and no one would back you up. I remember once when we were making heavyweights in North Carolina, and I doubt I was sober, but Maybe the Olympics was on, and I was just doing play-by-play -play, uh, as the uh, announcer for ice skating. Uh -huh. But maybe for two solid hours <laughs> of the most obnoxious, right. inappropriate, uh, career-ending play-by-play. And those are the most fun moments. Does the there. footage exist somewhere? Yeah, you know, there, Paul Sims and Larry Sanders show did take some, uh, there, there's some video of uh, So of he can hold that over your head. Yeah. Uh, we have, uh, I, I, I want to talk about This is 40, mm -hmm. um, which I have to say, when I watch the movie, I've moved uh, two, two and a half, three years ago from New York to LA, and when I f first started watching this movie, it was very personal for me because I have a wife, kids that are approximately mm -hmm. the age of your kids, and I live in this same area yeah. that you're depicting. Yeah. Literally and the same area. Literally the same area. And <laughs> Paul street. Rudd gets on a bicycle with Robert Smigel yeah. in, in one of the first scenes and is riding 
on San Vicente, which I do. And so I got very uncomfortable because I thought, I am uh, i don't like this. This is too close to me. But uh, we have a, a, a clip here okay. from, from This Is 40. Do you know which clip this is? Uh, I, is it the bathroom clip? It's, uh, I believe Paul it's has a, escaped. Uh, Pete has escaped into the bathroom. He likes his free time, and he uses it in the bathroom. Let's take a look. Hey. What are you doing? Uh, going to the bathroom. We're all downstairs waiting for you. You've been up here for a really long time now. Oh, I'm almost done. I'll be down in a second. Mm -hmm. Charlotte just did her first flip on the trampoline and she landed on her feet. She was really proud of herself. Oh, that's great. And you missed it. She'll, she'll, she'll do it again. Just... It's just, it's the fourth time you've gone to the bathroom today. God, give me a break. Why is your instinct to escape? That's not my instinct to escape from you. It is my instinct to come into the bathroom when I need to go to the bathroom. How come I don't smell anything? It's because I shoved an Altoid up my ass before I came in here. I mean... Let me see then. What? Let me see. No, I'm not going to let you see. You're not going to let me see because you're not taking a poop. I've been flushing as I go. You're flushing as you go. Who takes a half hour to go to the bathroom? John Goodman. Don't press enter. I'm not sure I want to make that move. <laughs> I love that he immediately has John Goodman <laughs> at his disposal, and he's probably correct. Uh, he could have said Rosie Greer. There's so many options. Yeah, but John Goodman. It has to be John Goodman. Uh, you have completely emasculated uh, Paul Rudd in yeah. this scene. He is sitting on a toilet right. having to defend whether or not he yeah. has Yes. Uh, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, <laughs> There are no barriers. The barriers are broken down. Mm -hmm. I have to ask, is this something you're commenting on in your own life? Have the, it's, it's the total evaporation of dignity yeah. between the husband <laughs> and the wife. Uh, well, I wanted to have scenes about the lack of mystery uh, in a relationship. When you've known someone for so long, you've just shown every orifice and every thing that makes everything kind of gross and not sexy anymore. Yeah. And so I sat down and you know, there's that scene and there's another scene where Paul asked her to look at his anus because he thinks he might have either a hemorrhoid, a worm, or a tear, and he wasn't sure which. Uh, so, and he um, wants her to check it he out. He wants her to check it out because they're partners. And um, now my wife would never walk in the bathroom, but she's definitely checking Twitter to see if I'm posting. <laughs> so, so that's kind of where you know imagination comes in. Because when we do these movies, you know, it's basically a third is from life, a third yes, is right. observations, and a third I'm just making up. Right. So Leslie would never come in, but in my imagination, that's the fight we would have. Yeah, and it's uh, and uh, Paul Rudd is so good at. I mean, what I love is the struggle for him to ma defend himself while he's on the toilet <laughs> with an iPad. My favorite. To thing me, is that that's the best thing yeah, is yeah. that he is defending himself, and yeah. it's like you know your pants are around your ankles. <laughs> You've lost the fight. You're, you, you lost the fight yeah. the minute she walked yeah. in. Yeah. You were done. Any fight if you videotaped. You'd see that I've, I've lost right away. In fact, he's lost the second she opens the door because he's like, on the iPad, he doesn't move, which I love. It just, he goes like this, as if he's gonna hide it, and then he kind of decides he can't and holds it over he's there. He's lost that, <laughs> he's gonna hold it over there. Uh, but, you know, that's, uh, you know, the thing I like about that scene is when Leslie opens the door, she knows she's gonna blast them. Yeah. She's, tr she's giving him a moment to just cop to it. She's just saying, just tell me your <laughs> ass, and then I won't be mad at you. Right. And it's the defense that gets him in trouble. Uh, and that's it's a lesson. It's always the cover up. It's what we learned at Watergate. <laughs> exactly. If I Nixon had said, oh, of course, everyone <laughs> exactly. does this. I make that mistake every day. It's always that I, do, I, you know, years later, there'll be periods where and there was a line that I cut out of the movie. There's a scene between Robert Smigel and, and Pete where he, he turns to Smigel and he says, is there a chance I'm wrong about everything? Mm -hmm. And Smigel's like, oh, yeah, definitely. You're yeah. probably definitely wrong about everything. The, um, for me personally, I, when I come home at the end of the day, I don't want to see comedy. Yeah. And it's a problem because there's a lot of funny stuff out there. Mm -hmm. I'll come home and my wife wants to watch Modern Family, mm -hmm. you know, or she wants to watch a comedy. And what I want to do, a perfect example of a movie I would want to watch after mm -hmm. a day of thinking of comedy and after for me about 26 years of thinking about comedy all the time is I want to go see Downfall, the German movie about Hitler in the bunker. <laughs> and I want to watch it. I want to go as far from what yeah. we do. Mm -hmm. I want to watch a dry documentary mm -hmm. about 
Ken Burns on the Brooklyn Bridge. Exactly. <laughs> I don't want to see irony. I don't yeah. want to see a silliness. I don't want to see anybody riffing. Are you that way, or can you enjoy comedy when you're uh, at the end of a long day? <clears throat> well, I was thinking when you said it that in the last year or two, I've had the, the first moments in my life where I thought, is comedy just a way of not being truthful and a way of hiding you know, how I'm really feeling or needing a protection when trying to get certain feelings across? And there are moments where it's not just that I'm sick of comedy. I get uh, moments where I'm tired of all storytelling and all modern entertainment. Yes. Because I'm just so in the thick of trying to think of things and write things and give notes and then I just hate everything, I hate books, I hate books, I hate magazines, and I just want to shut my brain off. But then a good episode of Mad Men will come on, yeah. and then I'm back in. And you're back in. Yeah. I have the same thought, uh, I have the thought sometimes, and I don't like the possible answer, which is, do people need more entertainment mm -hmm. from me? I have that thought, <laughs> like, I've done a couple thousand of these, people kind of have seen what I can do, yeah. and I'll get this very grim thought where I think, there may not, I don't want to be doing this if it's not yeah. needed. You want to be needed, yeah. and if you're not needed, I want to become a welder. I actually yeah. want to learn. Yeah. It's the, the cobbler, like uh, Daniel Day-Lewis. Daniel Day-Lewis. <laughs> I want to join Daniel Day-Lewis yeah. and learn to cobble shoes. Uh, How long would it take for you to get bored of you? Yeah. If you were watching you. Yeah. Well, I think it's different with talk shows because people uh, have runs with talk shows. Like, won't there be like years where like you watch a certain talk show and you kind of get into it and then you kind of give it a break for like a year. And then right. suddenly you find yourself like just one episode pulls you back into it's, a point of view again. It's funny, it's like you're a little, you're, I've, uh, George Meyer, who I referenced earlier, mm. one of, I think one of the great television writers of all time, uh, I get very down when I have a bad day or a day where I don't think I did a good show. I go into a very dark place and he talked to me about it once and he said, you're laying little pieces of mosaic tile mm -hmm. and you can't see the whole mosaic because it's made of thousands and oh. thousands of pieces. So some days you're, writing a ver you're laying down a very brightly colored piece yeah. and you feel great and other days it's like the faint, the light blue piece, which is the background for the mm -hmm. thing. But he said, it's all, make something when you're done. And I thought that was the most beautiful uh, rationale for just keep going. See, but this I, is my point about me not being smart. I couldn't have thought of that. Oh, I couldn't have, <laughs> I'm giving that to George Meyer. <laughs> but I, I had <laughs> yeah. Ron Howard say that to me early in my career where he, he, he said, he always imagines movies like a piece, like a painting you know, in a gallery and he said, you know, I try not to think about each one uh, too much in context, in context of its importance in my career, I, I think about being, uh, at the end of my career, walking through that hallway, you know, being proud of all of these things that I've made, right. uh, which I thought was a great way to it's look the same, at It's it. the same idea, which is uh, you, the only way you can survive doing this, because I think comedy's too hard. I really do. I think it's too hard to hang your... I hang my self-esteem on each moment of yeah. it sometimes, and I think I... You can't do that. But you, you, can, you can be too unhappy for too long. But you, you do it. See, when I did stand up, I always knew I wasn't as good as everybody else. But I also had like a insecurity thing, which was there's a part of my brain that was always saying, "Shut the f up! Who cares what you're saying? Why are you up there babbling?" And I'll get that even now. If I, you know, I, I did a speech. Uh, I got uh, an award at this. Uh, Hollywood Film Awards, mm -hmm. and, and so throughout the night, I was bored and I said, you know, as a joke, I'm gonna make notes on this entire show as if I'm the producer and I'm giving notes at the end of the night right. about how it went. Right. Music cue came in too early, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, and, and the, just vicious jokes about everything, and then when I got up, I read, I just read it. And it was maybe the biggest laughs I've ever gotten wow. in my entire career. The second I get home, I am so ashamed of myself. I, I'm embarrassed, I feel like, it's arrogant, and, and then I don't sleep. And there was not one bad thing said to me. People just thought, oh, that was fantastic. I've never seen you funnier. And I'm embarrassed at the part of me that wants that so badly. And that, that's part of why I became a writer, and so I'm still doing it. I, I've just somehow found a way to kind of hide behind a, a camera. So here's the uh, $64,000 question. Undeniably, there's a neediness. Yeah. 
I have an incredible neediness. You have a neediness. We want to make people laugh. It's more important to me almost than breathing. That's not healthy always. Yeah, yeah. Do we fix that? If you had a chance yeah. to fix it and you could be happier, do you fix it? It's an eternal question yeah. that never resolves itself. I get therapy. I've had people tell me, oh, don't get therapy yeah. because you're crazy, but you need to be crazy. We need the eggs. Who says that? <laughs> my that? wife. Gavin, <laughs> Gavin Pallone? Yeah, my wife's like, well, oh, this is working out. Shut up. <laughs> um, no, I've had, uh, it's, it's just, a, it's a question that's out there, you yeah. know, that's always out there if you're, if you live and die by comedy. And it's a. Uh, it's why how, you make funny people. I you, mean, I spent two years thinking about that yeah. when I was making funny people with Adam Sandler. I just, the, you know, uh, the whole movie was just me pondering, what is the point of this? What right. is wrong with me that I need this so badly? And is this what, you know, what's wrong with all of us? Because I, I have that, just what you're saying, I feel that from everybody in our community that some of us are doing it for very healthy reasons and we're sharing our ideas and there's kind of a beautiful uh, aspect to it, but then there's this like demented love me please, I'm hanging on every joke aspect to it at the same time. So for me, it was like Seth Rogen was a young version of me saying, yeah. is there a way for me not to become this ass? And then there's like the Sandler, which was kind of like the part of me that's like, am I turning into an ass? Do I buy into this too much? Am I wasting my time where I should be connecting with people more and not be in this kind of people pleasing machine? I have to say about funny people, I, when I saw that movie, I, I walked out and I, I thought, it is so hard to capture how comedy works. And I thought funny people came closer than any movie I could think of. And I was referencing things like Punchline, yeah. which is, um, you looked at it and you remembered, I know this isn't what it's like to be, stand-ups yeah. don't have lockers, yeah. you know? <laughs> exactly. There was things like that. And there were TV shows like uh, Studio 60, which had a lot of different things in it that yeah. I really liked, but it was so serious about how comedy Sketches works. Sketches were and, odd. Yeah, and also just the, oh my God, this is the most brilliant thing I've ever, like, no, that's not how we talk, that's not yeah. how it works. Mm -hmm. And I, I sometimes think it's impossible to depict really how yeah. it works, but I thought funny people got, it got in there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, uh, because you guys know, and Adam knows, and, and, and everybody felt pretty truthful about how it's a messy process, how... And Adam is just comfortable, you know, revealing a certain side of himself. I mean, it's really a brilliant performance and, and he was very courageous to, to go into a lot of those spaces. Uh, I mean, I was really proud of, of just, you know, his approach to the whole project. Because, you know, when you're gonna go work with a friend, you're like, I, I hope he doesn't, you know, argue with me about everything. I wonder what it's gonna be like directing him. Mm -hmm. And he was, he couldn't have been greater. I mean, he was just so easy and then gave so much to it that for me, a lot of that experience was just realizing how great a guy he was and how creative he was uh, and wanting people to, you know, to see that as well. He's also um, a very, he's a really good actor, yeah. Adam. And when I first met him on Saturday Night Live, just, you know, before he'd even become famous, mm -hmm. I was talking to him and he told me that his idol was James Caan. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I always thought at the time, I thought, really? Like mm -hmm. you, this young, super goofy, and I can all, I've been able to see it ever since then. He has a, Adam has an intensity and he has like a, a spiritual weight about him. And you can see it in yeah. Punch Drunk Love, you can see it in, in, in Funny People. Like he has, he, ha, he, he is a terrific, actor, he can be very truthful that way. And I think there are a lot of people that get distracted and think that he's the goofy guy in one of his- Well, he loves his... to make people laugh. Yeah. I mean, after we made Funny People, you know, he, he, he was like, you know, people think when I do, uh, you know, a different kind of movie, uh, like, oh, now he's doing this different kind of movie. He, he should do more of these. And he's like, I don't want to do more of these. I right. like doing one every once in a while, but you know what I like to do? I like to really figure out how to make people laugh their freaking asses off. Yeah. And uh, that's, but yet, when you're collaborating with him on something, you know, that kind of digs into pain and, and these other ideas, there's nobody better yeah. than him. So, I mean, again, like Jim Carrey, you know, 
these guys have these careers where you know Adam can you know make the wedding singer and 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 make Big Daddy and, and all these hilarious movies and then you see Punch Drunk Love and then and then they, they go back and Jim's like that too like I, I was so happy to hear Jim Carrey's going to do Dumb and Dumber Dumb and Dumber too yeah you know uh, but I'm also was blown away by Philip Morris so I, I I like that there's so many guys who have had both careers you know now, this indie why, career and a comedy career this brings up a really uh, area that I have to get you to talk about which is there seems to be a, I'll be silly mm -hmm. and make the money, but then I will do be serious because I want to get the Oscar. Yeah. How can we get people beyond that? They need their, if they're going to reward comedy, it has to be yeah. socially important. Exactly. <laughs> Whereas, to me, one of my favorite quotes is uh, when Groucho did Duck Soup, a very urbane reviewer said mm -hmm. to him, ah, yes, yeah, so... I, he watched Duck Soup and said, so this is your commentary on fascism, the rise of fascism in Europe, and its need to be stopped. And, and Groucho just looked at him and said, we're four Jews trying to get a laugh. Yeah. Like, that's, that's who we are. <laughs> that there seems to be, uh, and it's been proven over time, that to get your award, you can't be too silly. Yeah. You can't be too funny. It's got to be nuanced that people want that. Do you... Do you think that that can ever change? Do you think the Academy Awards can ever just have a, uh, an Oscar category for really f***ing funny movies? I, you know, I wish that they would if it's not, you know, you know part of it. Uh, but I don't know, Bridesmaids was nominated for two yeah. awards last year, and I, I, that was an encouraging sign. Yeah. I think that people just intrinsically think something dramatic and painful with accents is harder to do than uh, just an incredibly well-crafted comedy like The Wedding Singer. Yeah. Uh, and it's just not true. I mean, if I didn't have to have jokes, I could, uh, I could you know, go to sleep at much earlier. I mean, we're up late at night on the joke part. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and things can be just as complex uh, in, in a comedy uh, as, you know, I don't know. Uh, Seth Rogen is really funny on the, on the subject of why, like, people like you know, World War II or Holocaust dramas and think mm -hmm. they deserve awards and have no respect at all for for comedies. I mean, Seth, I, I forgot how he said it, but he's like, you think it's hard to make people cry in a Holocaust movie? Like, that's hard. <laughs> that's not hard at all. Animal House mm -hmm. might be a perfect movie, yeah. but you'd never give it an award. I don't know that, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's never gonna be. A, it, More people are watching that tonight than Gandhi. Yes, you know, people don't. Gandhi in the yeah. afterlife is watching it right exactly. now and saying, "My life was wasted. <laughs> exactly. This is better than anything I did." Yeah. But I mean, I, I do think a perfect comedy is next to impossible to achieve, yeah. and we don't respect them as much mm -hmm. as we should. Yeah, what we do like we do? them. We go see them. Hmm? What do we do? We have our own awards, a comedy awards. We'll hold it here in this old black room <laughs> that we stole from Charlie Rose. Um, Everything, when I lived with Adam Sandler, by the way, everything that we bought when we had to buy furniture, we bought all our furniture in one day for $980 for the entire apartment, and everything was this kind of like black glass. Yeah. This was, this was the... We had a table, <laughs> we, when we had this idea to do this show, for the first episode, I had said, it should be kind of Charlie Rose-ish, and someone, it must have happened to you a million times, where you say something lightly, and then a million people run out and say, this is what Judd wants. Mm -hmm. I came in to tape the first show and it was an exact yeah. duplicate of Charlie Rose's, I mean to a legally frightening degree. And I said, no, 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 that's, but you said, no, I, I just said Charlie Rose-ish, meaning yeah. let's get rid of the audience, let's have it be black and- uh, He changed the table once, like for a week and, and went with something more like this and it just destroyed the show. The show just, became unwatchable. He became, yeah, and uh, he went insane for a while. Um, we have a, uh, a question here, I'm gonna use this futuristic tablet mm -hmm. from uh, 30 years in the future, and it goes like this. Neslahan from Facebook, uh, any yes. favorite actress? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Neslahan, he's your old friend. Any favorite actors you'd love to work with other than the ones you already have? Who's out there uh, that you'd love to work with? That's a good question. You know, Zach Galifianakis makes me laugh. Yeah, he's great. Like, really hard. Like, you know, I'm dead inside like you. Mm -hmm. And so I'll like, I, you know, every once in a while something just throws you like, like I, you know, uh, Adam McKay asked me to watch the campaign 
when they were, it was early cut. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't think much about enjoying it. I just thought, okay, I got to watch this and give them some notes, and it's early in their edit, yeah. and I guess I got to do it tonight. I'm kind of tired. Now. And I put it on at 10 o'clock at night, and I, it just surprised me that I just started laughing my ass off and just forgot completely about the task of being helpful. And, and Zach really made me made me laugh. He hard. was his little dog, like walking through the town at yeah. the beginning of the movie with his little dog, and he's a really funny character. I mean, he, there's so many people I like. I'm just afraid, you know, I really need to be able to write something that's worthy of them. So, and there's people that I adore. It's just like, can I think of a story that intersects with them? So obviously, I love the, the people I grew up with, like Steve Martin and 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 Bill Murray and people like that. And then there's just a lot of like young. Hilarious people like Amy Poehler that you just think oh man. She's so funny And it would be great to try to fully max out what that is because that's what happened when we did bridesmaids It's like how funny can we make this right. how 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 can we make this like really emotional and really funny and 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 push? You know Kristen and Andy Mumlow the writer to max this out and, and that that's the most fun part for me Would you be too intimidated to direct? Steve Martin in that, you make a movie with him in that situation. Do you I'm know what intimidated mean? in the writing. I'm not intimidated once like we get there. If I like the scene, you know, when I was working with Albert Brooks and you know, I, I couldn't look up to anybody more than him. Yeah. If, if I've talked to him about the scene, by the time we get to the set, I kind of feel like, okay, I kind of know what I'm doing. But alone in a room going, can I write a scene that's funny enough for Albert Brooks? You know, that's where you have the meltdown. I, when I first came out here to LA uh, from New York after the late night show, Someone had a party and I went to it and Albert Brooks walked up and started talking to me. I'd never met him before. Um, I talked to him for a while. He made me really laugh. I left the party, got on my cell phone and started calling everybody I, I know. <laughs> yeah. And you think, you get to certain points, you think, can I meet anybody anymore? That yeah. I, th I think I've met everybody and I've certainly, I don't yeah. want to get jaded and I was so thrilled to just yeah. be in the same space as mm -hmm. Albert Brooks. First time I met him, I, it was in the early 90s. I went out to dinner with him and Gary Shandling, and I was so excited that afterwards I wrote down everything he said. And there were a couple of jokes that really made me laugh. One was he said, I, I forgot what movie, maybe they were talking about defending your life, mm -hmm. but he said, uh, yeah, Tom, ha Tom Hanks said to me, he said, uh, uh, I saw your movie, it was really smart, really intelligent. And I thought, why is he surprised that it's intelligent? He's the guy who did the, the show where he wore the dress, not me. <laughs> <laughs> was I was, a, it was a I terrible half-assed impression, but I tried to call no, it but up. I, I was Because if you're watching this interview this long, yeah, for this, no, we got to kick it up a notch. There's no one left at this point. But <laughs> when I was talking to him, he did a really funny thing. He, there was another guy there who knew him. It's just three of us chatting. And Albert Brooks told some story that was said something told some quick story that was really funny, and I don't remember yeah. that, and I laughed. Yeah. And his friend who was standing next to him said, well, I guess he had to be there. And Albert, <laughs> and, and Albert Brooks looked at him and went, no, you, you don't have to be there. He, it killed with, Conan was fine. He was fine, he, he laughed. There's no other place you need to be. And in that Albert Brooks way, he just kept hammering his friend. There was, there was no reason for that comment. And I thought, I'm in an Albert Brooks movie. Yeah, oh, it's the best. When he gets going, it, it's the best. I also remember him talking about the Menendez trial. He kept saying, you don't kill the parents and then buy a Rolex. <laughs> <laughs> it's the one thing you don't do. Sensible purchases. Um, this is 40. Yes. Is uh, coming out. It's coming soon, uh, December 21st. December 21st, uh, go and see that film. Uh, Heavyweights is coming out on DVD. Look at that. Finally. Heavyweights on DVD. <laughs> uh, and and uh, there's a great soundtrack to This Is 40 with music by Lindsey Buckingham and Fiona Apple and Wilco and John Bryan and Graham Parker. You get Parker. great soundtracks. Yeah. You, um, I like that part of it. Uh, do, uh, that must be, uh, I get the impression yeah. you just listen to music constantly. Yeah, yeah. I, lo I love it and I love that I, there's any way for me to touch uh, the music uh, aspect of it. The fact that I can force people I worship to write a song is uh, the best thing that's ever happened. You're sadistic, cruel. <laughs> You're a dictator <laughs> gone mad. Uh, Judd, I, this was, uh, if it was one tenth as fun for you as it was for me, then we've done something. This was really cool. Judd, thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Yeah.